Okay, so my name is my name is Radu Tulai. I am from the National Institute of Heritage Romania, and I'm also a PhD student at the University of Bucharest Faculty of Philosophy. I collaborate with Professor Gabriel Fihauser from uh, University of Stuttgart. He couldn't be here today, so I will answer the questions about my presentation, which is uh, the theoretical, conceptual, uh, philosophical part. The part that uh, Professor Fihauser of with the text annotation, the technical part, I will not answer, but I can give my email, you can send my email, and I'll forward it to Professor, and we had, can have a conversation. So first things first, we, we, for, for the annotation effort to start, we, 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 have to, we have to talk about rigorous definitions by Newell Belknap. He provided two criteria for definitions to be declared rigorous definition. The first criteria is the criterion of eliminability. A definition should explain all the meaning of a word. And there's also the criteria on conservativeness. A definition should explain only the meaning of a word. By a definition should explain all the meaning means that a definition should capture all the possible contexts for a word as best as it can do. And to, to uh, get the other two uh, elements of our annotation, we have to break the criterion of eliminability. And we, I will show you how. So first we have to ask, do the concepts that compose the text fragment each contribute to an explana explication of a singular concept? Do the concepts that compose the text fragment each contribute to the singular concept? If it is yes, then we, we are in this point. It is probable that a singular concept subordinating a series of concepts that compose a text fragment, a series of concepts define a singular concept, and then we move to it is pro probable that the formulation is clear only by enlisting the definitions of each concept composing the text fragment. So we have a definition. This side, we respect the criterion at length. But what happens if uh, we, we have a, a, a text fragment that does not laser focus on a concept? Then we have no. It is probable that each concept of a text fragment each equally contributes to a clarification. And then we have to ask ourselves, if the, is the formulation clear only by enlisting the definitions of each concept composing the text fragment. If it is a yes, then we have a thesis. But if we, we cannot uh, understand the text fragment without resorting to external text fragment, then the formulation is probably targeting another argument or a thesis or a definition, and that fra text fragment is an argument. So here we totally negate all the uh, criterion of eliminability for definitions. So this is a pretty straightforward algorithm for the text annotation part. We enter a title for an uh, article. We enter the metadata, authors, institu institution, public, uh, date of publication. And then we start with the first thesis. We tag the concepts in that thesis, and then we enter definition for each concept that we tag. Then we enter connecting arguments. We tag the concepts in the connecting arguments to the thesis. We enter definitions for each concept. And then we, we ask, are there any additional thesis and arguments? And if there are, we go back, we tag. If not, you ask yourself, are there any additional titles? If there are, you go to the beginning, you enter another article, and so on. If not, you have the end of the database. You have a pretty good database, it is complete or just satisfactory, let's say. And now I will show you how to uh, uh, use these connecting thesis and arguments for the concept of conceptual distance. So let's suppose we have three concepts, C1, C2, C3. Between concepts C1 and C2, we have th thesis one, thesis two, and argument one, argument two. They are present in this cluster, so there's a conceptual distance of zero. But if we have C2 and C3 again, 
we have a connection between C2 and C3. We have thesis three and argument three. There's, between C2 and C3, there's a conceptual distance of zero. But before C1 and C3, between these, we have a distance, distance concept, a conceptual distance of one. We have one intermediary. We don't have a direct connection. So imagine now that we have a further concept C4, and it is connected by the concept of C3, by the thesis four, argument four. We have between them a distance of zero, but between C1 and C4, there's a conceptual distance of two, actually. So we can see how the groups of thesis and arguments facilitate connections between concepts and give us the, the concept of conceptual distance. And this is a, a pretty uh, a decision tree for the algorithm from the computational concept map. So we left off at the, uh, at the annotation uh, algorithm with the end database. We already have the connections between thesis and arguments. So we now enter an initial concept when, where we start. Then we enter an, a destination concept where it should be the end of the algorithm. And now we browse for the initial concept where in what thesis and arguments we find the initial concept. And after that, if we can find one, you, we make a group of those thesis and arguments. If we do not find any thesis and argument where the initial concept resides, that's a no, we have to go back, we have to supply a valid in, in initial concept. So we, we, we have the group and then we ask ourselves, is the destination concept present? Probably not, we can't make it in the first try. So we saved, we saved the already explored concept uh, thesis and arguments group. And then we, we browse for the neighboring concept. So in the thesis and arguments where the initial concept arise, arises, there are other concepts. So we go to the neighboring concept and if we find him in another group of thesis and arguments, then uh, let's say you find it, it's yes, then you ask yourself again, is the destination concept present? If it's a yes, you save the explored solution thesis and arguments groups, you list the, the groups that you already found, and now you have the, the capacity to browse further. You already found it, but maybe you can find it in other instances as well. So if you want to browse further, you go to yes, you, you, find the, you try to find another group. If you cannot find another group, then there are no solution detected. You save the, the no solution explored concept groups, you list it that there's no solution, and you ask yourself, do you want to browse further? If it's a no, you list whatever you saved, whatever you found, and you stop. And this is how a uh, concept map should, looks like, should look like. We ha it's based on a text by Fabio Ciotti, Digital Literary and Cultural Studies, The State of the Art and Perspectives. Here we have four concept groups. We have the initial concept of digital humanity, and then we have the, uh, the destination concept of literary and cultural semantic web. In between, we have inter two intermediaries, the, the model modeling intermediary concept and the ontology intermediary concept. This means that between digital humanities and literary cultural semantic web, there's a conceptual distance of two. Now let's talk about the possible functions for these uh, algorithms. You could have straightforward requests. You could ask the, the the algorithm to give you concept maps, or you can try to ask the algorithm to give you a summarization. We already have four concepts that, can, that we can use to summarize this article by Fabio Ciotti. Questions, you can ask the algorithm to give you answers to questions, but in the beginning we will only have basic questions. These basic questions are something like a formalized model, of uh, uh, a subject concept, a quality for the subject concept, a predicate concept, a, sub, uh, a quality for that predicate concept, and an object concept, and a quality for that object concept. You can make, uh, between these predicate object subject groups, you, you make a concept map, and the common parts will become part of the answer. 
And, and lastly, and probably the most uh, spectacular, is you can design and simulate theories. Just imagine you have a database and you enter an original hypothesis. No other person has used this hypothesis before. The, this, the, the algorithm will track down all the concepts of the hypothesis, and then you can ask the, the design uh, feature, do you want additional concepts besides the hypothesis? And you can enter and see, you can make a concept map between the concepts in the hypothesis and the additional concepts. You can also exclude concepts if you want. You can access new concepts that you didn't think about because of the, the conceptual distances that are pretty, pretty close. So now I will, uh, this is my part, thank you. Uh, and that now I will play a, a clip from uh, Professor uh, Gabriel Fiehauser. First of all, hello and welcome also from my side, and my apologies for not being able to be here, that's a bit unfortunate. I hope that the presentation will also work well in this remote way. When I first heard about Rado's concept that he just explained, and he asked me whether one could work on it with digital ma humanities methods, because it's such, such a formalized concept, I immediately thought, yes, indeed, this is a very apt use case not only because it could be promising for a structural distant reading of large corporate texts, but also because it's a classical, the proof of the pudding is the eating application. If you develop such a very generalized system of categories and claim that it can be applied to all texts, then it of course seems to be a good idea to see if, it's, if this is really the case and if this can be tested empirically. In fact, it has been argued that it's actually a major advantage of digital humanities methods that one does not have to stick with a very abstract category building, but that you rather can also check the validity of such concepts by applying them to the real world, so to speak. More concretely spoken, Rado's categories are a very good use case for an annotation workflow, as it was developed in the context of semantic machine learning a while ago, for instance, by James Pustyovsky and Anne Stubbs. The concept was also introduced, especially to literary studies by Christ Meister and Evelyn Gius and Janina Jacke, at least in a German context, and enhanced also by the work of Niels Reiter, who comes a bit more from the computational linguistics side, to name just a few. As these researchers have shown, the first steps of such an annotation workflow should be a process that resembles a bit what in the humanities is called a hermeneutic cycle. At first you come up with a hypothesis, like that all theoretical texts can be divided in three parts. Then you set up annotation guidelines, which very explicitly spell out which part of a text should be subsumed under which category, and then you let people annotate texts. The clue of this workflow is that the annotations are not only done by a single person, but rather by different persons, so that at the end of the annotation you can check for the inter-annotator agreement. The inter-annotator agreement is a measure of how similar the annotations of the different people were, meaning that you can check if the different annotators mark the same passages in the same category. If there are differences, it will be then a good idea to see where annotators deviated from each other and also think about why they did that. Normally, in a first run, this inter-annotator agreement will not be that great, which will be mostly due to the fact that the annotation guidelines have not been spelled out clearly enough or that the categories are just not that well defined as you thought they were. So it's very likely that you will adapt these categories or the guidelines and go through another iteration and then the next one and so on until the internet data agreement is acceptable. Or you give up because it turns out that the concept is just too complicated or too far from the real world. So we applied this workflow for, to free article texts. For our first attempts, we thought it would be a good idea to keep the domain rather concentrated to see if the concept works on texts, uh, which are at least a bit similar regarding their discipline and also to some extent to their topic. Thus, we chose theoretical texts from the digital humanities and mainly texts that provide a kind of reflection of theory or methodology. 
At the moment, we have 12 annotated texts. Four of these texts were um, annotated by more than one annotator from two up to four persons. And this is, of course, the part where Jan Angermeyer and Götze Taban, our co-authors, come in. For our annotations, we use the tool CADMA, and also for calculating the inter-annotator agreement, we use the GITMA package for, for Python, which is very handy for reading out the CADMA annotations and for calculating inter-annotator agreement. Here you can see a bit closer what our annotations look like. As you can see, a single annotation normally spans a sentence or larger units of more sentences. However, it's also possible that there's a switching of categories in the middle of a sentence. And as you can see, CADMA also provides the possibility to insert commentaries uh, where annotators can write down why they annotated a certain passage in that way. What makes our annotation task special, also in regard to traditional approaches in argument mining, and what maybe makes it in some aspects a bit easier than other annotation tasks, is the fact that we expect every part of the text to belong to at least some category. So we can avoid the question whether a part of the text should be annotated or not, but rather only have to ask in what way should the passage be annotated. However, there are some passages in the text where annotators were unsure if they can annotate anything. But this relates mainly to paratext, for instance, headings or diagrams. For all other main texts, annotators were capable to assign at least one category. For calculating inter-annotator agreement, we use the getIAA function of the GitMA package, which first pairs annotations together and finds out which annotation has a match with an annotation in the other version, regardless of its categories. Then it checks if those matches have the same label or not. By this, IAA measures like Cohen's kappa can be calculated, which basically sets the number of the concurring annotations in relation to the concurring annotations that would have been found by chance. Because in our setting every piece of the text is annotated, the number of the matching or aligned annotation pairs is quite high, but it's not 100%, because sometimes the granularity of the passages that are annotated, annotated differ. Here it's actually a problem for the evaluation that we annotate passages, not sentence by sentence. Because if one annotator decides that the passage consists of a thesis and a notion, for instance, and the other things, the whole, things is a, the whole thing is a thesis, then this is counted either as correct pair or as incorrect pair, not as one correct pair and one incorrect one, as it probably should be. Here we did some manual post-processing to adjust the passages more exactly. An alternative solution would be to switch to the counting of sentences, but that would probably skew the results, because a thesis or an argument can consist of many sentences, and if two annotators only once disagree about the principal nature of the passage, that this would lead to lots of mis uh, mismatches sentence-wise. And here you can see the results of the inter-annotator agreement for the four texts. It ranges from some a bit weaker numbers below 0.40 up to 0.71, which would be a decent value. Obviously, the agreement depends very much on texts and the annotated pairs. Gitma also provides a confusion matrix which depicts which categories in the one text have been annotated as what categories in the other text. And here, for instance, for the text Hammond et al., A Tale of Two Cultures, we, uh, which has the lowest agreement, you can see that the concept of notion seems to be quite stable to detect and to differentiate from the other categories, but that rather often theses are mixed up with arguments. I will give you an example for this. Uh, this passage reads, our approach also faces several important challenges. Certainly the largest is whether an algorithmic criticism can be developed that could come to terms with ambiguity. One person annotated this as a thesis, obviously because it was regarded as a new claim. But the other thought, it's an argument, obviously because the person regarded is it as dependent on an aforementioned claim that says that the approach presented in paper has great advantages. Many examples are like this, and it looks like the differentiation between thesis and argument is also a matter of granularity, whether one considers a passage as new thought or part of a larger chain of thoughts. So obviously we need more testing on that in the future and also to annotate more, maybe also more diverse texts. But for us, it looks like a promising start that you can accomplish a differentiation into the three categories on a very general level. 
I want to conclude by giving you a quick outlook on the analysis of our orientation. As a first approximation towards distant reading the corpus, we could look at the distribution of the three categories over the corpus, and we can do that either by passages or by tokens. As can be seen, the distribution is quite balanced. Regarding passages, the argument category takes up almost half of all cases. However, the argument segments only consist of about the same amount of text as the notion segments. So there are more argument passages in the text, but they are shorter in length. Parts that can be classified as thesis in total have a lesser amount of tokens than the other ones what would be expectable, given the fact that thesis are mostly introducing a claim. But still, they make up about a quarter of the total text. Before we can improve our distant reading, we will have to enhance the base of our data, of course. So future work will be the annotation of more texts and probably also the enhancement of the categories. While it seems that the categories work well in their principal division, it might be useful to clarify the issues of granularity we have seen in the example. To make the categorization useful for the analysis of larger corpora, we also envision an automatic approach to annotate the categories. Once we have more training data, we will try out and assess common machine learning classifiers. It's our intuition that the three categories could be rather straightforward, characterized by syntactic formulas. If we think, for instance, of the argumentation category, it seems quite likely that we have least some causal clauses in it. Given this structure, we expect an engram-based approach to lead to best results. And with this, I will hand back to Rado. Thank you. Sorry again for not being here. If you have questions, you can uh, also ask me, of course, by email or via the wonderful conference app. Thank you.